So, um, as Marv said, I've uh, been at Johns Hopkins uh, actually for less than three years now, where I'm in the School of Medicine. Um, prior to that, I was at I was at U Maryland College Park, where we were colleagues, uh, and I was in the Computer Science Department there and, and ran a center for Computational Biology, which is what I do, but not what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I've been uh, sort of writing about uh, various topics in alternative medicine on my blog for a few years, actually about six years now. Um, and since coming to Hopkins, uh, in part because some of my colleagues uh, were familiar with my writings and heard me on the radio, they asked me to teach um, a couple of lectures to the medical students, which I've now done uh, did this year and did it last year, um, on alternative medicine. Uh, and I was surprised that they even had such lectures, but they have, uh, I'm a little bit uh, ashamed to admit, in the Hopkins medical curriculum, they cover alternative medicine. They don't have a whole course on it, but they do have some lectures on it. Um, and they actually asked me to come in and provide an alternative, alternative view. So, um, so that's what I did. Um, but I was surprised at the reaction of some of the medical students. Some of the medical students were, um, were very skeptical and sci scientifically inclined and um, don't really believe uh, um, in uh, the practices I was uh, lecturing to them about. But others do, and they didn't really want to hear from someone who was skeptical about them. So, I was uh, um, a little bit taken aback at that because this is Hopkins Medicine, for those who don't know, it is usually ranked number one or two in the country. So these are the, supposed to be the best trained doctors that we have. Um, and it doesn't take much looking around to realize that alternative medicine is taught everywhere right now in the U.S. Um, I haven't looked at other countries as much. I'm, I'm a little afraid to. But um, there, it, it is quite widespread. So um, uh, when, when J.D. asked me to come and speak again, I thought I would... Um, give you a presentation about what I could find about uh, the state of alternative medicine in our, in our medical schools um, with a little bit about um, the practice as well, not just about the teaching. It's a little hard to find the details of the curriculum on their websites. So, um, so let, let's, let's start. So by the way, these, uh, these images are not mine. They're just sort of uh, for entertainment. Um, so um, there's a few questions I want to address uh, in the next uh, hour. Um, and try to answer. Um, first, in order to talk about alternative medicine, we have to say what it is. So I'll say a little bit about that, or maybe a lot about that. Uh, I'll tell you, give you some examples of medical schools that teach it. I just mentioned Hopkins. I think Hopkins is pretty good, actually, and I'm, I'm there. Um, so the other schools do a lot more uh, teaching of alternative medicine. Um, and then I want to talk about where is it coming from? Who's supporting this? Well, you know, why are we doing it? And uh, why, is it, why is it being taught and practiced? And is it a growing practice or not? And if so, you know, why, why would it be growing? Is it because it's working? Uh, and I think the answer is, uh, is not that it's working, but there's other forces at, at play. So I'll try to explain some of that. So, um, so alternative medicine is um, now at, at something like 57 major U.S. medical centers, most of which have uh, medical curriculum and medical schools as well. And there's, in fact, a consortium for academic health centers for integrative medicine, which has been formed, uh, which, as it says here, includes 57 highly esteemed academic medical centers. And if you look at the list, I'm not going to show you the whole list. If you look at the list, many of them are our top medical schools. Some of them are really sort of dodgy medical, medical schools, not even medical schools, some of them. But uh, many of them are really highly regarded top 10, top 20 uh, medical centers. Um, and um, so it seems like this is really quite uh, widespread and, and uh, a very popular topic. Um, and, and I wrote CAM here, and I'll use that a lot. Um, that's the standard abbreviation for complementary and alternative medicine, um, which is one way to describe this collection of practices, and I'll describe a few of them. So, um, so here, just to kind of set the, the background, I'm not going to talk about all these things, but here are the list of topics from two uh, medical schools, one right nearby, Georgetown Medical School, uh, one at U Michigan. And you notice these topics are almost the same because they have actually come from the same source. Um, but I got these lists from their websites. Um, so let me just, let's just go through these very quickly. Um, so there's alternative medical systems, uh, which, they, which includes traditional Chinese medicine, um, Ayurveda, homeopathy, naturopathy. Um, there's mind-body medicine, 
which includes meditation and yoga. Um, there's manual therapies, which includes osteo osteo osteopathy, massage, and chiropractic. Um, Energy-based therapies, which is where acupuncture is usually listed. And biologically-based therapies, which includes herbal medicine and dietary supplements. Now, I could talk to you for an hour on any of these topics, but we're not going to go for 11 hours. Uh, so the list at Michigan is the same, and many other schools are the same. Um, and uh, there's actually a, a huge amount of material you can find out about most of these topics. And some of them are perfectly legitimate. I would say that, for example, massage is fine. It's helpful for certain conditions. Um, uh, Meditation and yoga, those are fine and probably helpful for some people in certain conditions. Uh, my mother does yoga and she loves it, so I think that's fine. Um, so one reason for putting up this list is that, uh, and I talked to the medical students about this too, is that when you hear about complementary alternative medicine and how great it is, it's often expressed, at least in the media, just like that. Like alternative medicine is a good thing or it's growing or it's, it's popular or it's valuable or it's useful. Um, but alternative medicine is a very poor way to describe anything because it's this broad collection of things. It's almost like saying medicine is a good thing. Well, you know, some medicine is good, some medicine actually doesn't work. Um, so some of these, some of these um, modalities, I won't, don't really want to call them medical treatment, some of these modalities are a um, little more than just fantasy. Um, some of them are effective ways to treat certain conditions. And you have to address each one um, on its own terms. You can't really um, just say something generally about CAM, um, because it's such a broad collection of topics. So, uh, for example, I would like to say all CAM is not legitimate. None of it's legitimate. We shouldn't touch it. But uh, there's a few topics in there that are legitimate. So you can't say that. It wouldn't be accurate. So, um, so there's too many topics for me to cover today. So I'm just going to actually uh, drill down on two uh, topics, which are the two that I talked to the medical students about, um, because I, it's, uh, it, these are two that I, I know a fair amount about. And, um, and they're relatively easy to, to explain. So let's talk about homeopathy first. That's one of those um, topics on the list. This is often um, discussed in skeptical circles um, because it's one of the easiest of the alternative modalities to debunk. Um, but let me explain what it is for those of you who don't know about it. Um, so this, this was invent. It sounds very sciencey. When I first heard the term homeopathy, which was quite a few years ago, I didn't have any idea what it was. But some a friend of my wife's practiced it, and I thought, oh well, that's probably something legitimate. Um, she's an intelligent person. Um, so this was invented by Samuel Hahnemann um, uh, a long time ago, over 200 years ago, in the late 1700s. And it was based on two ideas, two principles, both of which are wrong. But he didn't know at the time, and it really wasn't um, his fault. The sort of state of our knowledge of science was very uh, primitive then compared to where it is now. So one was that like cures like, the idea that if you have some symptom, that if I can give you something, some treatment that'll cause the same symptom or a similar symptom, and that will make you better. So for example, um, if you are itching, I can give you poison ivy, but only a very little bit of poison ivy extract, and it'll make you better. Um, so the other thing that, that goes with that is that diluting a substance makes it more potent. This is kind of a very um, counterintuitive idea. Counterintuitive ideas are occasionally right. This one is not, but they're occasionally <laughs> right. So, but that was his, was his idea was that you dilute it way, way down. Of course, if you give someone a little bit of poison ivy extract, they're going to get very itchy. It's not going to work. But if you dilute it enough, they won't get itchy. Um, or um, another homeopathic treatment is if someone is, needs to, need, if you need help sleeping, you can give them caffeine, but very, very diluted. So that's kind of the idea. And those are, in fact, homeopathic treatments for itchiness and for, um, for uh, uh, inability to sleep. So um, there's no scientific evidence to support either one. So he just made this up. Um, now, there's lots of great scientific theories that were just made up in the first place by the scientists who invented them, um, but then you have to go and see if there's anything to them. You have to go and collect data and validate them. So these two ideas, um, whether or not you think they're plausible, there's no data after 200 years to, to back up either one of them. Um, now, occasionally people will, on the first one, occasionally people will point out, well, what about vaccines? That's a good point. So it is true that in order to give you an immunization against say chicken pox, we actually give you a little bit of the, of the virus. Um, but um, we learned that much, much later. Uh, we learned about, vac about vaccination only really in the 20th century to come to understand it. Um, and um, in that very specific case, um, we know exactly what's going on. We're exposing you to a little bit of an antigen that your immune system learns to recognize. And we all have this thing called the immune system that can actually remember antigens that it's seen and respond quickly if it sees them again. 
and, and fight off the infection. So, you know, this, even this principle in a very specific context might be correct, but as a general principle, it's not. Generally, giving you caffeine is not going to make you sleepy. So, but nonetheless, homeopathy is still quite popular. So let me sort of show you a little bit, a little bit more about it. Um, so a typical homeopathic, so homeopathic preparations um, are often um, described by the degree of dilution with the larger numbers referring to more dilute and in the homeopathic world, more potent treatments. So they use the either C or X, C is more common. If you go to your local Whole Foods, you can find a little section on homeopathy and there's rows of little bottles um, that treat all kinds of things. Well, as they say on the bottles, they treat all kinds of things and they'll say 10C, 20C, 30C. Um, so what's a C? Um, the C is a one to one hundredth dilution because the Roman letter C is the number 100 in Roman numerals. So basically this is a homeopathic um, um, site that shows you how to make them. So you basically take your substance, you dilute it by a factor of uh, one to one hundred in, in water, um, that's one C, and then you just repeat that. That's two C, you repeat it again, that's three C. And so you do that 30 times and eventually, so one C would be one to one hundred, two C would be one in 10,000, three C would be one in a million. So you very quickly get very, very dilute. Um, 30 C, which is a typical homeopathic dilution, is ridiculously dilute. Um, that's 10 to the 60th. Um, so if you had a pill that was, just to illustrate sort of how ridiculously dilute that is, if you had a pill that, um, whose diameter was the distance between the Earth and the Sun, so the single pill had that diameter, then on average you would expect it to contain one molecule of a substance at that level of dilution. So basically, a pill at anything which is 30 C does not contain a single molecule of the substance it supposedly is giving you. And everybody who knows even the most basic biology or chemistry today knows this. Now Hahnemann, in his defense, didn't know this. Avogadro's number, which defined how many molecules there are in a mole, um, which, would, which would show you this, was actually already discovered when he came up with homeopathy, but he didn't know about it. It, was very rec it had very recently been discovered. Science was not communicated that quickly at the time. Um, so we now know there's actually a finite number of molecules in a solution, and if you divide things up, eventually there's no molecules left. You can't keep dividing, but he thought you could, and so did many other people at the time. Um, not that dividing things that much would leave them potent, but in, in any case, we now know that there's not even a single molecule of the substance. But you can go to um, the store and you can buy right now. This is a popular substance. I've blogged about this once or twice. You can, you can buy um, at your local Rite Aid or CVS or Walmart um, oscillococcinum, which is a homeopathic preparation. There's many homeopathic preparations you can buy. As I said, you can buy them at Whole Foods. This is a particularly popular one because it's a, um, supposed to, uh, or at least claims to, be effective in treating the flu, the influenza virus. Um, so this is a picture uh, from their website. There's a picture of the package. Um, and um, it has this, you know, it's safe for everyone ages 2 to 102. And that part is definitely true. They're just, so they're just sugar pills. Um, but they're not really cheap. They're actually quite, quite expensive. So um, if, you, if you pick up the package, here's some facts about um, acylococcidum. Um, it's manufactured by this company called Boron, which is one of the top homeopathic uh, manufacturers in the world. It's a, um, very profitable company, um, and it, as it says, they claim it has this remarkable record of safety, has no side effects, those are all true. It does say there's four, four clinical studies, including two that are published. <laughs> That's kind of raised the question of why you're even claiming there's these two studies that weren't published, but they, they claim there's four studies that show that reduces the severity and duration of flu-like symptoms. If you go and look at those studies, they don't show that at all, um, but they do claim that. Um, the active ingredients are Here's what the active ingredients is. It's this, I'm not going to read this in Latin because um, my Latin isn't very good, but it's, it contains this extract of duck liver and heart. That's just a Latin phrase, which means extract of duck liver and heart um, at a dilution of 200 C. So there, it's even more kind of crazily dilute. Um, in principle, you could probably take um, some water from your local tributary or from your tap and it would have if this substance ever touched any molecule of water on the planet, then they'd all be at, at more than 200 C, uh, have this substance in it. But here, it's basically sugar. Um, so, but there was actually a review of studies of this particular treatment in the Cochrane reviews um, that, that said the overall trial um, standard of uh, reporting was poor and a lot of methodological problems. Um, 
And they concluded in this review that there was no difference between the effects of acetylcoxinum and placebo in the prevention of the flu. It would have been really shocking if there was any difference. Um, or, or rather, I would say, if there had been any difference, I would be looking to see, well, what bias crept into their studies? Because it's simply not possible. We know, pharmacologically, it's simply not possible for a sugar pill um, to have any better effect than a sugar pill, which is the placebo, because <laughs> they're the same thing. Um, so, um, so that's a homeopathic preparation. There are many others, um, but they all are these incredibly dilute substances and generally don't work. But they're, they're not really regulated. So they, they look like drugs. You go to the drugstore, you buy them. They look like drugs, but they're not regulated. I'm not really going to talk about that, but since the, the late 30s when there was a congressional bill, the first congressional bill introduced to sort of protect them by a, a homeopath who was a member of Congress, um, they have their own kind of registry of homeopathic uh, substances, and if you're on that registry, you can just package it up and sell it, and you can say things about it as long as you are a little careful about not claiming to, to um, cure a specific illness or condition. And a lot of these companies cross that line, and then the FDA will send them a warning letter, and then they'll change their marketing a little bit, and they'll just continue. So you can look at that package right there, um, and does it say this drug... Uh, yeah, actually it does. It says, reduces duration and severity of flu symptoms. So that, because they have this study, even though it's a bad study and it's been reviewed, um, um, even though it's, I think they're allowed to say that, but they have these words all over the package that make you think this is for flu. Uh, and people buy it. In fact, I just discovered, because I was looking this week, at CVS they now have a generic version of it. It's not like <laughs> they do. You can buy the CVS version of acylococcinum. It just says sort of flu relief on it, I forget, I think it's called something like that. Um, and it, it wasn't cheap either. So, um, so that's homeopathy, and even NCAM, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about, the National Center for Complementary Alternative Medicine, which is NIH, can't really support homeopathy. They, they used to have more supportive language on their okay. website, and the language they had there was really not accurate. So a lot of scientists complained to them, so they modified it a, a couple of years ago, and this is what they say on their website. Now, there's little evidence to support it, and they also point out that Several key concepts are inconsistent with fundamental concepts of chemistry and physics. So um, NCAM sort of says the right things here. Uh, yeah, and yet, I was just um, noticed just last week, this is from CNN's website, um, just a few days ago, um, there was an article, How to Avoid Digital Eye Strain. Okay, we all sit in front of the computer all day, um, so I thought this, this could be interesting. Um, and this, this um, doctor, here, who is actually a real doctor, an ophthalmologist. Um, he's also a homeopath. And um, among the things he says to do is homeopathy. He says, speak to a practitioner. And he mentions one of the most common homeopathic remedies is Ruta graviolens, um, an ornamental plant. And it can greatly reduce the symptoms of eye strain. Um, that's what he says on this article. So I looked I look that up. It's not hard to look up. There's a picture of a of Ruta graviolens, 30C. Um, although the little package there says it's traditionally used for sprains and tendonitis, but if you look, it's also used for eye strain. Um, so it's also called Rue. It's a common herb. Um, it's known for its bad smell. Sometimes used to keep cats out of the garden because they don't like the smell. Um, it's used for a variety of conditions by homeopaths, but it's not been shown effective for any of them. Not surprisingly, because a 30C dilution is not going to even have Rue in it. So even if Rue worked, it's not going to be in the homeopathic version of Rue. Um, it's very easy to find examples like this. Um, those are the only two I'm going to give you. There's many other uh, homeopathic medicines. I just got a few pictures. You can get homeop homeopathy for ADHD. You can get it for um, labor and birth. You can get it to treat Lyme disease. You can get it to treat leg cramps. You can get it to treat acne and other things. Um, but all of these preparations, they're not regulated. They contain these incredibly small dilutions of substances that even if they weren't diluted, have not been shown to be effective. So, um, so that's homeopathy. Let me just now switch to one other um, example, which is acupuncture. This is the only other alternative modality I'll talk about at length, but in the discussion you can ask me um, about other methods, which I might know about. It's hard to keep up. So acupuncture is probably uh, more than homeopathy, more than really any other method, probably the most commonly taught CAM method. When you look around at what medical schools are teaching, they all teach acupuncture. Some of them do homeopathy, some of them do not, uh, but they all teach acupuncture. So what's acupuncture? You probably know, but I'll just sort of say what the main um, ideas are. So it's this pre-scientific superstition. It goes around, it goes back a long time. Um, it's based on something called qi, which is spelled in different ways, usually um, QI. 
which is supposed to be a life force or vital energy that flows through our bodies on invisible lines, which are called meridians. Um, so there isn't actually a plausible mechanism, not a physiologically plausible mechanism for why this would work, but what you do with acupuncture, I didn't put that on the slide, what you do is you stick needles in along these meridians, stick needles in someone to manipulate the flow of chi and make them better. Um, acupuncturists themselves actually don't agree on where these acupuncture points are or where the meridians are. Um, even the ones who are you know, highly trained experts, they don't actually agree on that, but since we don't have any physiological evidence that these things exist, you wouldn't really expect them to agree unless they had very careful documentation that they all shared, which they don't. Um, there have been a lot of scientific experiments. I'm going to show you, uh, talk about a couple of them next. Um, but the, and the experiments show that it doesn't work. Not surprisingly to me, but um, this argument is very hard to convince a lot of people of, that it doesn't work. There are a lot of people who believe in acupuncture. Unlike homeopathy, which really isn't plausible, acupuncture is a real intervention. You're actually doing something physical to the person. You're sticking a needle in them. That's going to cause a physiological effect, for sure. Um, it might cause a benefit. I mean, you can't just a priori say it won't work. Um, there is something going on. With homeopathy, you can say a priori, there's no way this can work. There's nothing in these pills. They're just sugar pills. So you could get a placebo benefit, but you won't get any other benefit. Acupuncture, you're doing a real manipulation. Um, so there are many medical schools that, that teach it. There are many medical schools and medical centers that offer it. Um, um, so here's just an example from Duke. Um, Duke is one of our top medical schools. Um, so here's something from their site. Acupuncture is recommended for a wide variety of conditions such as acid reflux, insomnia, fibromyalgia. Uh, and says research shows strong results in these conditions such as osteoarthritis, fertility, and chemotherapy related nausea. And each of these words here, each of these phrases, actually refers to a study that did purport to show that, that, that effect. Um, and, and they say dozens of medical centers are adding it, including them, and they have a provider who is a doctor of acupuncture. Now that is not a real doctor, I would argue, but that's, um, that's what this doctor, that's what that degree refers to. So, um, so Duke and many other medical schools, including, unfortunately, uh, occasionally, Johns Hopkins, are teaching students that acupuncture works. When I lectured on acupuncture uh, and alternative medicine, they had another lecturer who actually spoke to them right after me. We had a sort of uh, not exactly debate, but a sort of alternative points of view, and, and he believed that all works and told them that acupuncture works right after me. And I don't know how many of them believed him, but some of them I think did. Um, so, so does it work? There's been a huge number of studies. Um, so literally hundreds, possibly thousands of studies of acupuncture. Um, so it really, um, it's very widespread and it has been subject to scientific study for many different things. So. Um, I'm not going to go through lots of studies for you. I will talk about one. Um, but here's a, here's a um, publication from a couple of years ago that's a review of reviews. So in addition to studies in the scientific world, we do reviews now and then where you look at the literature on a particular topic and you write up like, here's what we know today. Um, and then occasionally, because there's enough of them, you just, there, if there are enough reviews, you can review all those. And that's what this group led by Edzard Ernst, um, who's written a lot about acupuncture. That's what they did. They look at all the reviews. Um, Specifically asking, does acupuncture work for pain? Which is probably the most common thing that it's um, claimed to, to work for and used for. Um, so they asked, does it alleviate pain and are there serious risks? They looked at all the reviews, they kind of judged how well done they are and they look at what their conclusions are and decide which ones are believable based on how carefully the method, methods were followed. Um, so their conclusion, this is from their study, is that um, numerous systematic reviews that they reviewed have generated little truly convincing evidence that acupuncture is effective in reducing pain and serious ad adverse effects continue to be reported. Now, there isn't, because acupuncturists aren't real doctors, we don't actually track adverse events. So there, are, there is some reporting, it's mostly voluntary. In major medical centers and hospitals, there's a lot of reporting because it's required to report adverse events. Um, but they were able to collect um, some information on adverse events too from these studies. So they, they concluded it was mostly just placebo effects. So let me say a little bit about that. Um, most of you have probably heard of placebo effects. That's also an interesting topic um, that's not, that you could, could talk about for hours. So many people um, experience subjective benefit from uh, almost any treatment. And in doing studies of acupuncture and other methods of alternative medicine, um, the placebo benefit comes up a lot because when you're doing a study of something like pain, especially pain, um, there's no objective way really to measure pain. You know how much you're hurting, but I don't know. There's no way I can find out either, except by asking you. 
And there are all sorts of ways of asking using um, graded scales that have been carefully explained to the patient. But that's basically what you do. You ask them, how much does this hurt? Uh, or is your pain getting better? And they tell you whether or not it's getting better. And placebo benefit can be real. It's hard to know, even if in the case of pain, it's hard to know if it's real or not because the patient uh, or subjects in a study, it's a very common phenomenon for them to want to tell you, the experimenter, what you want to hear. And we know subjects do this and we try to control for it. And a properly done study will control for that by doing what's called blinding. So the experimenter is not really supposed to know which uh, treatment they're, they're uh, administering. And the subject's not supposed to know which treatment they're getting if, they're, if you're comparing different treatments. And that helps to control for that. Um, that way they can't just tell you what you want to hear. But nonetheless, um, you might actually get some benefit because you think it ought to work. And you might feel, subjectively, feel a little less pain. That'd be OK. There's nothing wrong with getting a placebo benefit. Um, so, um, but an important, and many acupuncture studies do show that it works better than placebo or better than nothing. Um, and uh, if you get some benefit, then one argument is, well, why not? It's getting a placebo benefit. Why don't we give acupuncture just for the placebo benefit? Because that is a benefit. So that's certainly real. Um, but if you're looking at anything, including acupuncture, scientifically, um, it has to work better than placebo for, for us to conclude that it works. Right? The reason that we use placebo controls, when we do a study, we use something called, we often use placebo controls. That is, we give subjects a placebo treatment as part of the study to control for the placebo effect. So if the people in the placebo arm have the same benefit as the people in the treatment arm, then you conclude that it didn't work. That's why you, you use a placebo. That's a standard scientific design. So, um, so if your medicine is going to be effective, or you're going to conclude in a, in a scientific study that's effective, it better work better than placebo. It doesn't mean that the patient gets no benefit. It means their benefit, um, the benefit of real medicine has to be uh, uh, significantly better than placebo. So, um, so, all right, let's, let's apply slightly, that slightly more rigorous criteria and look at acupuncture uh, for chronic pain. And here's a paper that appeared about a year and a half ago and it got a huge amount of publicity. Um, this is actually not a study, it's a review, again, of a meta-analysis um, uh, led by a guy named Andrew Vickers looking at um, acupuncture for chronic pain. Um, a meta-analysis is, is not a study itself, but it's where you go and you don't simply review the other studies, that is, read them and summarize them. You, you extract the data from them and you combine the data into sort of a bigger data set so that you can analyze it with more statistical power. That's the idea. Meta-analysis, in principle, is uh, effective and can be very powerful, but um, because you're combining data from multiple studies, it's uh, notoriously subject to cherry picking. So you can choose which studies you include, which data sets you include, and not include all the data sets. And then your statistical power turns into um, uh, a very misleading uh, effect. It can, anyway. But a Vickers study concluded um, that acupuncture is effective for the treatment of chronic pain and therefore a reasonable referral option. Um, and, uh, and this was in the Archives of in Internal Medicine. And uh, they claim that there were significant differences between true and sham acupuncture uh, that indicate that it's more than a placebo, um, although the differences are relatively modest. But even so, even if there's a very small difference, if it's a real difference, this would be interesting. It would be, despite all these hundreds of studies that really didn't show an effect, they said, no, no, we're seeing an effect and it's better than, um, better than sham acupuncture. So in order to, well, so, so I looked at this and I was skeptical. Uh, a lot of other people were skeptical. Um, the investigators here are, include a number of acupuncture practitioners. And you can see the acupuncture trialist collaboration. So they are probably biased. They want it to work. So you, I looked at a few of the studies, as did others, that they actually <coughs> combine data from. So to figure out whether what they're saying is true, you can't just believe it, even though it's, a, it's published in a good journal. You, you, if you really want to know, you have to go and look at some of the original studies as well. So I just I'm going to talk about one of them. This is one of the studies that they combined into their study. Um, and this was from a few years before in 2006 called Acupuncture and Knee Osteoarthritis, a three-armed randomized trial uh, done in Germany. So what did they do? So this study um, randomized about 1,000, just over 1,000 patients into three groups, acupuncture, sham acupuncture, and nothing. So physician, physician visits where you got no acupuncture. Um, so the sham acupuncture is um, and that's a common way to try to control things. It's not placebo, but it's um, not real acupuncture. Um, so you, you do needling, you do stick needles in, but you stick them in only a little tiny bit, 
normal acupuncture needles get stuck in further. And they put them at a random location, but to try to control things a little better, the random location isn't totally random. It's near the acupuncture point, but it's not the right point. Now, when you look at the acupuncturist sort of literature themselves, there's no real agreement on what those points are. But anyway, they had acupuncture experts who were participating in this trial, and they, would, they decided where the real points were, and then they, the sham acupuncture was, okay, we won't use those points. We use something nearby chosen in some small radius randomly uh, around that point. Um, and that's not supposed to work either. So if acupuncture works, it should be better than sham acupuncture, and it certainly should be better than going to the doctor but not getting acupuncture. And they define success, all right, so this is for pain. So how do you define success? So they define the measured pain with a questionnaire. They define success as at least a 35% improvement on the pain index in their questionnaire, um, as determined as a fairly standard questionnaire for pain. So their results were in this group that got just physician visits, 29% reported um, improvement with no other uh, treatment at all. And about the same percentage reported improvement with acupuncture and with sham acupuncture, 53% with acupuncture, 51% with sham acupuncture. And those numbers are not statistically different at all, as you can see from looking at it. You wouldn't expect them to be. So um, some important caveats here. The investigators were not blinded to the treatment group, so they knew whether it was sham acupuncture or real acupuncture, and, of course, and they certainly knew if there was no acupuncture. Um, there were also more adverse events, hematomas, in the acupuncture groups. Not surprisingly, because you're sticking needles in the skin, so now and then you'll get um, some bleeding, which is what a hematoma is. Um, but anyway, there's, um, in both cases, you get half the patients reporting an improvement in, in their pain. Um, but without the acupuncture or the sham acupuncture, you get 29%. So just looking at even a little bit more deeply, this is from the study itself. What Sharf et al. did the study concluded, if you look at the top, they said, they, they said their conclusions is both TCA, that is, um, real acupuncture, traditional Chinese acupuncture, TCA and sham acupuncture improve pain um, in patients with osteoarthritis of the knee, more than conservative therapy. Um, they said, surprisingly, no differences were observed between TCA and sham. I don't know why they were surprised, but I thought, you know, in a scientific paper, you don't really write that. But they did, which I think reveals a bias, um, clearly reveals a bias. Um, they said, this study does not allow us to determine whether the observe effects of this acupuncture and the sham was due to placebo effects or intensity of provider contact or some other physiological effect of just needling. Um, so um, they also reported, and I looked this up, the studies of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, that is um, ibuprofen, usually report higher success rates than, than that seen in the study for conservative therapy. So in the conservative therapy group, you could take ibuprofen or acetaminophen. You could take a pain, pain reliever, and they didn't get a very good effect from that. But, um, I looked at um, studies of ibuprofen uh, for knee pain and found response rates as high as 84%. A large review found that ibuprofen has a 50 to 60% improvement over placebo using the same exact uh, Womack score index. So 50 to 60% report improvement with ibuprofen and they got 50 to 53% with acupuncture. And that was a large review. So just as my reading is if you just take ibuprofen, you'll do just as well, um, at least as well. Um, and the other conclusion out of this study is that sham acupuncture was just as good as the supposed real acupuncture. So somehow, combining this study and a number of others, Vickers concluded that not just that acupuncture works better than placebo, but that uh, by combining enough studies that acupuncture works better than sham acupuncture. I didn't see the evidence for that in those studies. Um, but that was also just for pain. So that's just one way that acupuncture is used, one claim that's made about it. It's claimed to work for all kinds of things. So let me give you a quote from um, Brian Berman, uh, who's director of the Center for Integrative Medicine at U Maryland. He's a, he's a big star in the alternative medicine community. He's brought in lots of funding to U Maryland Medical School. Uh, when I was at Maryland, I wrote a couple of uh, articles highly critical of them, just to you know, see if I could get their attention. Um, so this is an interview that was published pretty, fairly recently, um, where the interviewer asked Berman, what were the findings on, among, this is a long interview, but this is just, what were the findings on acupuncture for infertility? And he said, it said that a study, and I'll show you that, it said that acupuncture definitely did make a difference for pregnancy rates. That was clear cut. He said, I had a couple of female patients who had been unable to conceive, so I treated them with acupuncture, and they got, you know, they got pregnant. He never knew whether it was just coincidence. This leads me to think it was the acupuncture. <laughs> this is really, I mean, it's an interview, right? So maybe he's not being careful, but this is really not what you would say if you're a scientist. So, so anyway, he said clear-cut benefit. So let's look at that study that he was referring to. So I looked at that study. 
Um, that was a study published in 2009 called The Impact of Acupuncture on In Vitro Fertilization Outcome. At least I think that's the one he's referring to. There are others. Um, this study found, and this is from um, Harriet Hall's summary of it, um, which she wrote up on Science-Based Medicine, uh, a blog that some of you might know about. Um, the study found that acupuncture was not effective at in increasing the pregnancy rate during in vitro fertilization. That, so it, they tried it, didn't work. Um, however, <laughs> the author, Donar, Domar, who's the lead author, said, despite the results of my own study, I still recommend acupuncture to women going through IVF because there's no downside. Um, of course, it's not free. Um, so, to me, that sort of illustrated, and I think Harriet Hall had the same reaction, that the people who are doing these studies are often really committed to the notion that acupuncture works. They believe it works. So they're just trying to collect evidence that proves what they already believe. And even when their study contradicts their belief, they're not willing to let go. I mean, she did a study that showed it didn't work, and she's still recommending that women do it, that they get acupuncture. So um, it's easy to find clinics offering acupuncture for infertility. It took me about 20 seconds to find one right here in Maryland that offered acupuncture for fertility and accepts insurance. Um, so there's no evidence that this works, but you're actually allowed to offer it. It's not illegal to do that. Um, so there's, what about other uses? I just talked about pain. Um, there's studies of it for infertility, studies of acupuncture for many other things. Well, I'm not gonna go into those, but I, I have a, a little illustration of what is, I think, going on. Uh, with all these studies, for, with the hundreds of studies of acupuncture. This is XKCD. If you don't know that comic strip, it's hilarious. It's one of my favorites. It often, they often write about science. So here's, um, the figures are always stick figures. So here this, this um, female stick figure says, jelly beans cause acne, scientists investigate. Um, and they said, no, we're playing Minecraft. So then they stop and they go do study. They start doing studies. We found no link between jelly beans and acne. Um, that settles that. And then she says, oh, I hear it's only certain colors. So they say, we found no link between purple jelly beans and acne, P greater than 0.05. We found no link between jelly, brown jelly beans and acne, P greater than uh, 0.05. And it goes on like the card comic strip goes on like that for a while. Um, and if you look at all these, you see there's one right here. Whoa. We found a link between green jelly beans and acne. Whoa. P less than 0.05. And then there's the headline the next day, green jelly beans linked to acne. So that's what's going on in a lot of studies of CAM. That you do enough studies, some of them, are gonna show a relation. And then, you know, you get a headline, and there's a headline. Um, this is what happened after the Vickers study. He reviewed all these, he did this meta-analysis of all these studies and said, it really works, and, and he got a headline in Time Magazine, he got a headline in the New York Times. Um, as far as I can tell, looking at it uh, even a little bit skeptically, it's not an even slightly convincing that acupuncture works for pain. So, let's, let's move on to another topic. So what, what, are, what medical schools are, are teaching and practicing CAM, complement alternative medicine? Um, lots of them. I just wanted to highlight a few just to um, uh, put them on the spot a little bit. Um, so Maryland is a big one. Maryland has a Center for Integrative Medicine they've had for over 20 years, headed by Brian, Brian Berman. I had a quote from him a minute ago. Um, and they have a curriculum in integrative medicine there. Um, and they all sort of teach the same things. Um, Here's um, the CAM program at Georgetown, which proudly says it was the first one um, uh, in the country in response to a nationwide NIH-funded educational initiative. Um, so there's a program here at Georgetown. Um, Duke, which I mentioned before, they have a program in integrative medicine. Um, and this is actually describing their patient care practice, so they actually offer it to patients. Uh, the Univ University of Michigan has a CAM program. This describes its curriculum with the, the usual set of sort of five categories of things. And those categories come from NCAM. That's why they all sort of use the same ones. Um, there's something called the Institute for Holistic Health Studies at San Francisco State. So there, and there are 50 others. It'd be easy to find. So it's very widespread. Um, it's being taught despite the fact that as best I can tell and as best many other scientists can tell, the scientific evidence supporting it is really not there. So where did it come from? Why are all these medical schools teaching complementary alternative medicine. It must have come from somewhere. So um, what I'd like to argue is that it came from Senator Tom Harkin. It's really just from him. Um, now, Harkin, I like Harkin. He's actually been a big friend to the National Institutes of Health. He's a f big fan. And so, and so the intramural staff, the staff inside NIH, don't like to say anything bad about Harkin. I've talked to them myself. I'm friends with a number of people at NIH, and I've talked to them about it, and they think, we like Harkin. He, you know, he helps us. He supports us. 
However, Harkin believed back in the 80s, the 1980s, that bee pollen cured his hay fever. So he just decided that bee pollen had cured his hay fever. I don't know whether his hay fever went away or not. I don't know how much bee pollen he took, but there's this thing called bee pollen. You can easily buy it at health food stores. You can probably buy it at Whole Foods. I didn't look. Um, and you can buy it in bottles like that and in other forms too. So just pollen that bees pick up and you can take it and it's offered. Um, and there are various claims made for it, including that it'll help you with um, allergies. And usually it's not claimed. It's claimed to be a superfood nowadays, seems to be the popular claim about it. But anyway, he believed this and he thought, why aren't we studying this? This is great. Why aren't we studying more of this? Let's have NIH um, set up a special office to study these alternative treatments. Now, NIH, you could study bee pollen um, without a special office. You can study any treatment you want for any disease you want. You write a proposal to NIH. I do this all the time. That's how I, my work is funded. And if your proposal is considered meritorious, you get funded. But it's extremely competitive. Right now, only about 10% of proposals get funded. So 90% of them, even if they're reasonably good, they don't get funded. Have to be really good ideas. So Harkin in 1991, earmarked $2 million to create something called the Office of Alternative Medicine at NIH. And you've probably heard a lot about earmarks and we're supposed to be like not doing them anymore. We still do them, but um, they were um, uh, more popular a few years ago. I'm sure they're gonna come back, but um, it was very easy for him to do this in the way that the laws were being made in the early 90s. So he created this office and gave him $2 million. Now there was some outcry among scientists because they didn't like this. Um, they thought giving some special status to alternative medicine uh, was legitimizing something that was not legitimate. Um, so for example, here's a quote from Alan Bromley who was president of the American Physical Society um, in the 90s saying that the Office of Alternative Medicine has bestowed the considerable prestige of NIH on a variety of highly dubious practices, some which clearly violate basic laws of physics and more clearly resemble witchcraft. So he's not pulling any punches here. So that was great. Um, the New York Times called it Tom Harkin's folly. That was a quote from them. So um, this didn't affect Harkin at all, so he didn't care. Um, however, Harold Varmus, um, who was the NIH director in the mid and late 90s, tried to rein in the Office of Alternative Medicine as best he could. He had, the money was there, he had to spend it that way, but he tried to, uh, to sort of impose as best he could scientifically rigorous standards on the studies that they were funding, which is what NIH tries to do with all of its work. Um, Harkin didn't like that, and if you want to read an interesting anecdote, you can read um, Varmus' uh, memoir that he published a few years ago where he describes being called on the carpet in Harkin's office and having his job threatened. Um, but anyway, the response from, from Harkin after, after Varmus, the head of NIH, tried to rein it in a little bit was to introduce the bill to rename the office um, the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. Now, a national center has a different status at NIH. The director has less control over it, so that's why he did that. Uh, and then the next year, he dramatically increased his budget um, to $50 million. So just to show you what happened, I, I went and graphed their budget over time. So this is back in 92, the first year the office was founded, um, when it was $2 million. So this is millions of dollars on the y-axis. And uh, the budget kind of slowly increased. And then here in 98, you see that was when the center was created. Um, where he basically doubled the budget, but then he more than doubled it the year after, and it sort of steadily climbed until in recent years, everything at NIH has been flat, so it's been flat at around $120 million a year. So from this small earmark, it's grown into this enormous, well, relatively large um, center, which has a lot of money. So that's where this comes from. Um, so um, the reason, the, the biggest reason that medical centers and uh, medical schools are doing so much in CAM is that there's money and there's, if you offer this kind of money, there's always some people who, who want to take it. Um, so, but you could ask, um, well, what about, you know, this sort of, it's going up and up and up, maybe there was something else going on. Um, was it, was this increase in funding spurred by successful treatments? Because if they had some successes, that would be another legitimate reason to increase their budget. Um, no. So after two and a half billion dollars spent, this is a headline from NBC from a couple years ago, um, two and a half billion dollars spent, no alternative cures found. So actually, if you look at the history of NCAM for over 20 years now, they've studied every, in that uh, one of my initial slides, listed all these moda modalities, not just homeopathy and acupuncture, but also Ayurveda, uh, Reiki, ener various energy medicines. Um, none of them have been shown to work. They've funded a lot of studies and have yet to show that any of these, any of these methods work. Uh, better than placebo. So um, from my point of view, from the point of view of a lot of people who are scientists who rely on NIH funding, it's a complete waste of money. We didn't really need to study them in the first place. There was no good plausible mechanism. 
NIH would fund your study if you had a good argument why it might work. But anyway, the money's been spent. And I should say, in addition to NCAM, there's also an Office of Complementary, and Alter Complementary Cancer Alternative Medicine called OCCAM, O-C-C-A-M, at the National Cancer Institute. So this $2.5 billion includes the money that goes to that, which is almost as big as NCAM. So cancer has its own, the Cancer Institute has its own separate pool of money for alternative medicine. So there was a hearing a few years ago um, that Harkin and a couple other senators held reviewing NCAM and its progress. <laughs> And, and they realized at this hearing that like nothing was working. None of these alternative medicines were shown to work. And Harkin complained about that. Um, and these are quotes from, this is a quote from Harkin. One of the purposes of this center was to investigate and validate alternative approaches. Quite frankly, I must say publicly, it has fallen short. Now my response would be, it has in fact investigated. You said they had to, and they did. They did lots of studies, hundreds of studies. But Scientifically, you don't set out to validate something, because if it doesn't work, you won't validate it. You, you investigate it and see if it works or not. Um, but he also said, Harkin that is, said, that the focus of NCAM, in his view, was, was disproving things rather than seeking out and approving things. So this is sort of fundamentally um, wrong-headed, and this is why we, we really, although we are completely dependent in the scientific community on, well, almost completely dependent on government funding to fund a lot of our research, because it's such uh, sort of long-term, research, you, don't get, you can't get private enterprise to fund it. So we have to be careful, or we try to be careful not to criticize Congress, because that's biting the hand that feeds you, right? But that really reveals a very deep misunderstanding uh, of science. You don't set out to prove something. You set out to investigate something. And if it works, then uh, your results are positive. If it doesn't work, then you say it didn't work. Um, so he was not happy with that. Um, but he was also reflecting what I've seen to be a sort of common theme in, among CAM proponents who are doing the studies. That, they're setting out trying to prove something works, not trying to prove that it, uh, not testing whether or not it works at all. Oh, and so, um, by the way, what about that bee pollen? The, the cause of all this. Um, so is bee pollen, does it work for allergies? So there's another picture of bee pollen. No, it's been studied. Um, it's, it's not safe. In fact, in particular, with people who have uh, uh, allergies to, to pollen, it occasionally causes severe allergic reactions. So it's not effective at all for allergies. In fact, there's a, study here that um, reported, there's a couple of studies like this, a bee pollen induced anaphylactic reaction in an unknowingly sensitized subject. This is a case report of a subject who took bee pollen and had an anaphylactic, went into anaphylactic shock. So it definitely doesn't cure allergies. If you're really sensitive, it might, um, it might, could be very harmful. Um, and we could have found that out without spending two and a half billion dollars. So um, the other mission of NCAM, though, and the reason why you see now 57 uh, medical centers teaching complementary alternative medicine is that a lot of their money goes into training. So if you look on their website, they have a dual mission. Um, they have a research mission, but they also have a training mission. And this is just uh, some text directly from their site where they're training people on clinical practice of complementary alternative medicine and training people on how to do research in alternative medicine. So they have training programs. You can get funding to learn about CAM. And this, in, to my mind, actually is really um, strange, actually. You're talking about a, a pretty major investment in a training program to train people in a set of methods when you haven't yet shown that they work. So it really doesn't make sense to have a training program in a, in a set of methods that don't work or when you don't know if they work or not, and yet we do. So that was set up at the same time that NCAM was created. Its mission has always been training. So before we knew whether anything worked or not, before the studies were even done, um, NCAM was funding training. And, they, and so, they, so you can go and get a fellowship to study complementary alternative medicine from NCAM. There's also another very uh, large funder, not as big as NIH, but um, there's something called the Bravewell Collaborative, which has um, been putting a lot of money this is a private um, foundation, so they can do whatever they want with the money, but they invest a lot in complementary alternatives medicine as well. They have conferences, they give awards. This is from their, from their homepage. And so they're dedicated to supporting um, complementary alternative medicine and the promotion of that. Okay, just a couple more things, um, uh, and then I'll stop and take questions. So this is from Georgetown's CAM course. I don't want you to read this whole paragraph, but um, this is a, a course that was just offered this year, at least from the website it appears offered this year. And so what they're teaching is, again, the five domains of, of CAM, which include traditional Chinese medicine. I didn't talk about that. Unani medicine. This is a new one to me, so don't ask me what it is. I don't know what it is. Ayurveda. I do know what that is. Homeopathy, naturopath, naturopathy, chiropractic, acupuncture, and energy-based medicines, you name it. So they're teaching 
students today in Georgetown, which is an excellent medical school, otherwise an excellent medical school. Um, they're teaching students about these methods. And one thing I want to say about um, the students that I, I've encountered at Hopkins Medicine is that they have a very intense curriculum. I'm sure they do at Georgetown as well. They've been trained as undergraduates, and they're still in medical school. They're just barely beyond undergraduate school to just like take whatever their professor says and remember it because you're going to be tested. So they're not trained to be skeptical. They're not, not trained to question what the professor is saying. So if they're being taught this stuff, they're going to believe it. They're not going to go look in the scientific literature. That's not part of medical training. They're not going to say, oh, this sounded weird to me. I'm going to go and see if it works or not. They're just going to try to remember everything the professor said so they can repeat it on a test. And they probably will never have to say it again. But if they go off and practice medicine, they may very well be asked about, asked about these methods by patients. And then what are they going to do? Probably just repeat what they learned in medical school. Um, so, so CAM is really entrenched. So what can you do about it? What can someone like me do about it? What can you do about it? If you don't think, I mean, I mean some of you might think some of it works. Um, I hope you don't. But um, what can you do to sort of stop this? We're, we're not going to defund NCAM. There are people who've tried to do that. I've started a petition a few years ago to try to defund NCAM to stop the funding. That certainly would have a major effect. If NIH didn't fund it, these top medical schools at least wouldn't be interested if there was no money in it. Um, so um, there's a few things we can do. Um, we can try to educate students in critical thinking. I think that, and I've been talking to some of my colleagues at Hopkins, so in a small way, we, the medical curriculum does not really contain uh, any element of critical thinking, and I would, it would be nice if it did. If we taught them how to read the scientific literature skeptically, how to read studies, and not believe them, but read them not just to find out what the conclusion was and, and take that home with you, but to see if you believe the conclusion in the first place. Um, and break them out of this sort of uh, standard way of, of memorizing, taking tests, and moving on to the next course. Um, so I, this, it would be great if we could make that more part of, of today's curriculum. I'm doing a little bit at Hopkins, and we would need hundreds of other people like me to try to do that to change the curriculum, and maybe over time this will happen. Um, we also need to, and this is something you can all help with, educate the public. Uh, so CAM practitioners need customers. There's a, this is a very lucrative industry. The, uh, you know, acupuncture and homeopathy and other methods, they all cost money. You have to pay to get these treatments. Uh, sometimes you have to pay a lot. Um, they don't work. If people know they don't work, they're not going to pay money for them. The people are pretty, uh, most people are pretty careful about that. So they, they only pay money because they think there's a chance that these treatments might work. Um, so we need more skeptical customers, and that would also undermine um, some, of these, some of these methods. And again, CAM, I'm using the phrase, but the, the term CAM, because that's the common term. But it does include practices that are okay, that are probably helpful to people. So if CAM to you means you know, drinking herbal tea to relax, that's fine. If it means you know, getting a massage to help you relax, that's fine. But if it means getting acupuncture, I'd say, no, nah, hang on a minute. You're paying, some, you're paying good money for something which is probably not going to give you any benefit, and it might ha cause some harm. Um, and so what else you can do is there's, there's lots of arguments people make on the other side. And I've, I realize my presentation is completely one-sided. I'm aware of that. This is a skeptics organization. I don't believe these methods work, so I, I'm telling you um, some reasons about why I don't think they work. Um, but you have to be prepared for the arguments on the other side. I've heard them a lot of times. So here's two of the most common arguments that I hear. You need to be ready for this so when you have a chance to discuss it with someone, you might have a, maybe have a chance of convincing them uh, to think again. So one argument that's made all the time is more research is needed. You're not sure that it doesn't work, so we need to do more research. That's the argument that says keep funding NCAM. And another argument is what's the harm? Maybe there's a little benefit, maybe it's only placebo, but what's the harm? So I just want to give you, uh, this is my last couple of slides. Um, to the more research is needed argument, I would say, look, after over 20 years and over two and a half billion dollars, of research funded by the NIH, NCAM has failed to show that even a single new therapy works. So at some point, enough is enough. And I'd also point out, as someone who works in the biomedical community, funded by the same entity, NIH, every dollar you spend on CAM is a dollar you could have spent on a real treatment, on something that otherwise might really work. So it's not without cost. Spending money, uh, there's only a certain amount of money that goes into NIH, devoting uh, any percentage of the NIH budget to NCAM is taking money away from, from other, uh, other research. And this is just a recent headline. More research in traditional Chinese medicine needed. You see that all the time. So even when, when a study comes out is even slightly positive, the conclusions of the studies are always more research is needed. You see this all the time. Um, 
And uh, in real science, eventually you say, okay, we don't need more research. We, we've done enough. We need to, we need to look uh, for some other way of treating pain or some other way of treating infertility besides this method because it's not working. Um, what's the harm? Um, there's a lot of good answers to that. There's a great website called whatstheharm.net. Um, some of you might have seen it, uh, which documents um, not just alternative medicine, but many other um, uh, beliefs, but it's big on, it has a lot of information about alternative medicine. Um, it documents um, in their long list of cases, hundreds of thousands of people killed and hundreds of thousands more injured um, from believing in things that don't work. Um, here's a couple of examples, just about homeopathy in particular, because I talked about that before. So here's a case, um, uh, Jacqueline Alderslade, this was from about, uh, from 2001. Um, a homeopath told her to give up her asthma medicine and she died of an asthma attack. So this, this is what the harm is. That can, asthma is not usually fatal, but it can be, and we can treat it very effectively. Um, there's another case, in, even more tragic, this small girl down here. Um, she was prescribed medications. She was epileptic. Um, epilepsy is very manageable. We can't cure it, but we can manage it. Um, she was prescribed medicine, but her parents consulted an iridologist, an applied kinesiologist, a psychic, and an osteopath. She was being treated purely with homeopathic medi medication when she died in 2002. So that's the kind of example you can tell people, look, there is harm. The harm is that uh, people who believe in alternative treatments sometimes use them instead of effective treatments. So there are, in fact, alternative, complement alternative treatments that are harmless. There are some things that are harmless, and uh, if you do them and, and take your regular medicines or do whatever you need to do for, uh, for real conditions, it generally is harmless. But it's not unusual to find people substituting um, things like homeopathy for real medicine, and then, then you can have real harm. So that's the answer I give to people who say, well, what's the harm? All right, so I'm gonna um, stop there and take questions. These are, um, this is my homepage if you care about my, my science. That's my Forbes blog. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to take your questions now. Uh, we were referred to a holistic vet. We had a cat with a number of intractable problems and we went to the vet and I'll shorten the story by saying he eventually said, well, stop all the other meds and give the uh, homeopathic stuff. My first question is, how come somebody who's taken basic physics, basic chemistry, understanding 10 to the 6th dilution and the, the fact that there's no molecule in what's being administered, actually reconcile that with fundamental training? And the other question is, some of this stuff is covered by insurance. Yeah. Why don't the insurance companies simply say, we're done, there's been enough research, it doesn't work, if you want it, at least pay for it yourself. My answer is basically, I don't know. I have actually a good colleague, I won't name him, um, but he's a good scientist. He, he's French, where homeop in France homeopathy is bigger than it is here. He thinks it works. I was shocked to discover this. Yeah, he's a well-trained molecular biologist, knows biochemistry, and he just thinks it works. I, and I don't know, I think there's people who are able to maintain uh, in sort of a different part of their brain these beliefs that they learned long ago, and that's the only way I could explain it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it seems to me that uh, marijuana would be might be considered an alternative medicine, and if you could get it sucked into this, it would, it, would, it, would, it might reshape some of the uh, politics. You could, but so, you so, so are, are there are there that is, do people apply for studies of marijuana to? And, and to well, I don't know if they apply. Um, there's none that are funded. I can tell you that. But the homeopathic preparations are on this list called the pharmacopoeia. Um, which was created originally in 1938. It was updated in the 90s, but if you're on that list, and cannabis is not on the list, but if you're on that list, you're treated specially. Um, so the FDA is basically required to essentially leave you alone. All, the, all that the homeopathic preparations have to um, sort of certify is that they've created the dilution and put that into the sugar pills. Um, yeah, here. Do you see any potential implications for CAM from the Affordable Care Act? Um, you know, these might be fairly cheap treatments, popular treatments, and then the politics flows in to enable CAM's expansion. So there was a clause inserted in the Affordable Care Act that was debated a lot in the blogosphere last year that will guarantee coverage for certain kinds of alternative treatments. I'm not sure what the status of that is. Is There was, there was an effort by a number of, of, of medical um, uh, skeptics and, and uh, medical doctors to try to change that. It hasn't been changed yet, and so I, I'm afraid it's probably going to be, uh, some of these practices will be covered by healthcare.
Um, yeah, let me go to the back there. Uh, yeah, doesn't uh, NCAM have a disincentive to basically disprove or cross off their list any of these things because that would reduce their funding? Um, so it's funny how the intramural people at NIH work. Um, I've worked with a lot of them over the years, not the ones at NCAM in particular, but they've, uh, they've certainly been uh, the target of a lot of questions from, from skeptical scientists. Um, so yes, the short answer is yes, they definitely have an incentive to show that some of these methods work so that their funding level will be maintained, they'll keep their jobs. Um, but you know, in their defense, some, but not all, but some of the directors of NCAM have tried to be a little bit more rigorous. I noticed in the last few years, they've tried not to fund the sort of more outrageous kinds of, of treatments uh, and look at things that have a little bit more plausibility. Like you do, really don't see them funding homeopathy. I've, I've looked, you don't see them funding this, some of the studies that they were funding before. Um, yeah, in the back. About two thirds of Yelp reviews are like five stars. Um, so take it for a grain of salt, but if I go on Yelp and look for reviews of acupuncture clinics, chiropractors, um, they're all four stars. The only, uh, I, almost universally, the only negative reviews were um, like customer service issues, like I didn't like the office or, or they treated me rudely. But uh, the, all of them were positive uni universally in this area, and I was wondering if you could comment on that. So yeah, sure. So I didn't... Um get into this particular kind of argument, but it's a very common phenomenon that someone is very happy with their alternative medicine practitioner. They're happy with their homeopath, they're happy with their acupuncturist, they're happy with their chiropractor. Um, and this is a common phenomenon. So when you talk to um, real doctors about it, uh, Mark Chrislip has, has talked and written about this quite a bit, um, most conditions that we go into the doctor with are self-limiting. So this is widely known among, I'm not a physician, I should say, but Many, many physicians will, will uh, verify this. So most people come in, they're sick with something, some pain is very common, or a cold, something which is self-limiting, that is, it, go, it gets better on its own. So if you do nothing, the patient will get better. If you're nice to the patient, and you spend some time with them, and you do something completely ineffective, most of the time, they will get better. The difference is, in that case, they will credit your treatment with having gotten them better. And this happens all the time, and you cannot convince those patients that they got, would have gotten better on their own. They really believe, because of the coincidence between they went and they saw the doctor and they, and they got better, they believe the doctor helped me get better. And the, the only way to sort of test those sort of experiences is to do a scientific study, but most people don't really want to hear about that. They know from their own personal experience that it works, so they become uh, very convinced that these methods work. And another, another advantage that alternative practitioners have is most of them are not as busy as real doctors. And many of them spend a lot more time with their patients. And, they, and there is some benefit, actually, in spending more time with the patient for whether it's placebo effect or not. The patient does feel better when the doctor spends more time, or the treat uh, the practitioner, not necessarily the doctor, spends more time with, with you. Um, I like it when my doctor spends more time with me and talks to me. I don't like it when a doctor is uh, abrupt and only gives you five minutes. So, uh, so they generally have a better experience with alternative practitioners than they do with some real doctors. And this is not good for the medical profession, but real doctors are actually offering effective treatments, so they're in more demand, so they're busy. Um, and uh, some of them handle that better than others. But it's just sort of human nature that you, that you, credit, what, um, you credit whatever was done most recently with the effect that, is, that comes soon after. Yeah. Um, we started this to talk about the increase in, in this kind of curriculum in institutes of higher learning. And yes. as an educator, I'm wondering, obviously you walk a fine line, you, you do need to have your research funded, you want to keep teaching, but are there avenues for you within your institution to advocate for changing the curriculum? What kind of, I mean, are there committees you can sit on? Are there secret there are. suggestion boxes that you can stuff and say, <laughs> well, are there public debates between different departments? I mean, what are your options? Um, Hopkins has a medical curriculum committee I'm not on the committee, but they have a committee. Um, most, I think, if not all, um, medical programs and PhD programs too, they have committees of faculty that decide what's on the curriculum. They don't change very often. The curriculums don't change very often. Um, there, I only recently became aware that, that alternative medicine is somehow, there's some um, advice from the American Medical College Association that you should do it or, or it's encouraged to do it. I'm not sure where this comes from. I suspect it's from NCAM. Um, so Hopkins has in our medical curriculum a certain number of hours that they are delivering in instruction in alternative medicine. I think it's like eight to ten hours of instruction. 
I only learned that this year. I was startled, and I started, I've now started asking, like, what can I do about that? I'm a professor at Hopkins. Why are we treating, uh, teaching our students these methods that don't work? Um, so I, you know, I'm, I give a one-hour lecture to the, to the first-year medical students, but they still get nine hours that are not um, that are not skeptical. They actually learn a little bit of how to do acupuncture. They do it on each other. They're allowed to opt out of that part, actually. Um, and I contacted um, the person on the curriculum committee, the faculty member who is uh, responsible for that part of it, the alternative medicine. And she was very defensive. She likes it. She wants to keep it in place. She said we went through the right protocol. So she's a believer. Um, and I could spend a lot of time and get into a big fight and maybe win after a few years. I don't know if I want to do that or not. But it would be a lot of, it has nothing to do with my research, but it, it's, it's entrenched. So um, it would be nice if all the other faculty on the curriculum committee would, would say, what the heck is this? But a lot of faculty, a lot of professors and doctors, they have no idea what these, pra these, these various words mean. So they kind of say, well, acupuncture, I've heard, maybe that works, it's okay. You know, homeopathy, what's that? Well, uh, maybe it's okay, I don't want to fight about it, I got other things to do. So um, it's a struggle to try to, to, try to change it. Uh, let me go over, over there. I'm actually a physician. No, I mean, no, I'm, I'm very mindful of the fact, especially as a pediatrician, that it isn't, it, not only are many conditions self-limited, one of your biggest challenges is the parent that comes in the pediatric practice, the parent that comes with the child, and they come because they really want something, they want a product, they want a solution, and you don't really have, always have the time to go through all these things and say, well, you know, you may, you have, you may have read all these things on the web, on Google, on Yelp, none of which have been really critically reviewed, as you rightly say. You know, and then you have this fight. And on, in the end, you know, you have to look at it and say, well, for many of these minor conditions, 90% of pediatric practice is minor conditions. You know, they come mostly because the parents are worried. And, you know, those have not been subjected to clinical trials. Clinical trials are run for things that, you know, justify the expense required to do such a large-scale trial with all the rigors that go with them, you know, $700 million and several hundred thousand patients sometimes for some of the larger things. So, you know, I sympathize with the sort of the attitude that, well, it's not doing any harm, why not just let it go? You know, because there will be some benefit, you know, even just by placebo effect alone, maybe. <clears throat> you know, having said all that, I started by saying I really agree with what you say and I, I'm really happy with, you know, uh, the issues that you've raised. And I always wonder if it, on a larger scale, if it isn't a question of teaching the public to be more critical about what, what they see. Sometimes, you know, you get this thing of, you know, well, it's in print or it's on the web, it must be true. You know? Or, you know, it, and they, they sort of use it as a quote and say, you know, it's like a reference in the literature. It's like, it's like reading a peer-reviewed journal. And you already pointed out the fallacies in some of the peer-reviewed publications. So if that's bad, you can well imagine what Yelp might be or what Google might produce. Right. You know? um, that's a very good point. I would, I would sort of add that um, in addition, and, and the average person on the street and, or parent is not going to go into the scientific literature, but I didn't talk about it, but there are a number of very popular TV shows and popular TV doctors, like Dr. Oz, I would point out in particular, <laughs> who promote a lot of these pra very practices uh, and say that they work on TV. And people think that's very credible. Someone like Dr. Oz is far more influential than I am. And he, you know, he's at, has an appointment at Columbia Medical School, also at Outstanding Medical School. He's a surgeon. Uh, he has, I uh, forget where his MD is from, but it's from a top medical school. So he has all the training, and you would think he would know. So if he says something works, people believe it. So he's very influential. And if you watch his show, I went through his website um, a couple times last year to see, like, what's he been talking about. And almost everything he promotes is unproven. Some of it is clearly wrong. Some of it is just unproven. Um, but it's very influential, so I expect people, and it's, it's actually well known that when he mentions something on the show, sales of that go way up right away. They go way up. Two so, questions? All right. What about the role of the American Medical Association? How do they influence curricula at universities, and do, you know, do they have a strong role? Well, it's not the AMA per se, but the American Association of Medical Colleges. Um, has a very strong role, and so if something, if they, if they were to issue a statement that you shouldn't teach alternative medicine, that would have a huge impact. I don't know how you go about getting that to happen. So they are not, I don't think they're even focusing on this issue right now. But yeah, there is, na there is a national organization. 
that pays attention to medical college curricula. Um, well, that's not who they are. So, but they would have an influence. It's just that uh, with enough work, perhaps um, they could. This could be on their agenda, and they could slow it down. But right now, they're not paying attention uh, to the growth of this part of the curriculum. Uh, what is your take on anti-aging medicine? <laughs> so, if there is some anti-aging medicine, first of all, I want Why some myself. <laughs> um, so there are many treatments that are promoted as anti-aging. Uh, frequently, they're foods um, or vitamins or supplements. And one of the reasons for that is that you, they're not really regulated. So you can make um, carefully make claims about your food um, or your vitamin or your supplement. Those aren't regulated, and the FDA won't come after you. Um, as far as we know, I, I actually follow aging research pretty closely. It's not what I do, but I follow it pretty closely. As far as we know, there is no substance that will slow down, and certainly none that will reverse aging. There are, in petri dishes and in cell culture, we can make cells live a very long time. So there's substances we can add to solute to, to cells that will, say, restore the telomeres, the ends of chromosomes, and make them keep replicating uh, seemingly forever. So we can make cells into immortal cells. But the problem that we have with that, and that sounds like, okay, that's what we want. We want to, like, live forever. The problem with that is that when a cell keeps dividing in your body, that's a tumor. It's not <laughs> immortal. And so it really is. So it, there's a delicate balance in your body between cells only divide when they need to divide to heal some damage. Um, there are a few types of cells in your bodies that divide your whole life. Like your skin is constantly being replenished because it's being rubbed off. But your brain cells aren't growing. They more or less stay the same. There, there's some evidence that a few, a little bit of replication can happen. They're basically, they're not growing. Your heart's not growing. Your other organs are not growing. Um, so there's a few types of cells that need to keep growing. Um, so there's research on that question, very serious research on how to slow down aging. Um, there's dietary restriction um, studies. And there's good evidence that dietary restriction, severe dietary restriction, will dramatically extend the lifespan First, that was discovered in nematodes, C. elegans, and then it's been looked at in mice. It makes them live a lot longer. There are people doing it to themselves, trying to see if it'll help them live a lot longer. Um, very difficult research to do. Um, it's being done in primates as well. The primates seem to be healthier, the ones who are on restricted diets, but the restriction is so severe that you have to be really careful not to get malnourished. And it would take a huge amount of willpower too. But we don't have any anti-aging treatments. So there's certainly no creams or lotions that are gonna make your skin like a 12-year-old um, none of that. None of that works. I wish it, w it would work. If it did work, um, you would. If someone comes up with something like that, some some treatment or some medicine that really does reverse aging, there's, we will all hear about it very quickly. Because anything that works will be dramatic. Will be hugely successful. But unfortunately, nothing works yet. All right. Thanks. <laughs>